So I have the message tonight is called Wrong Way, God. <laughs> uh, we're going to be looking in Exodus. Uh, you can turn to Exodus chapter 3 if you want. Uh, Deval Gajira once said, uh, when you are stuck in the same routine, you stop seeing new opportunities. Go ahead and go to that first point there, buddy. Uh, when you are stuck in the same routine, you stop seeing new opportunities. You know, a lot of times we kind of get, I guess you'd say, our, our focus off on uh, what God's trying to do, where God's trying to lead us. Uh, many of us know who God is, what he wants, what he's promised. You know, it, 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 we, we understand that, most, you know, most of us. And some of us are still learning, and that's okay. But for a lot of us, there's that place in us that we just, we understand, you know what I mean? We know who God is. It's, there was never in doubt in our mind. And we know the things that he's promised, you know, out there somewhere in the, in the great beyond. Um, we just feel stuck. We just feel stuck. You know, it's, it's not that we don't know who God is. It's not that we don't know what he's promised. We just feel stuck. And... Um, and we live, we live with lost passion for God. We live with kind of like a... It's not that we forget what God promised, but we kind of forget what God's promised. <laughs> I mean, if there's no other way to say it, there's just there's, there's something inside of us that we... Like somewhere, it's, it's rattled around somewhere back there. We just... We don't see it for so long that we just kind of lose, lose track. Exactly. Um, emotional withdrawal from the pain... See, what we do, especially spiritually, is somebody hurts us or something hurts us, and so we withdraw, right? Because it hurts too bad to keep loving people. Um, this is kind of something that always happens. You know, there, there's something, whatever it was, you know, something makes you angry or sad or mad or whatever. And, uh, you know, it just kind of festers in, in a way, and it makes us bitter, you know? And uh, because of that pain, we decided that we we're just going to withdraw because, you know, it can't hurt you if you don't, you know, get close to it. The problem is a lot of times, the, this, all the time, this transfers to other areas of our life. We think that we can simply withdraw from what God wants us to do and stop caring and stop loving. And somehow that won't trickle into our marriage, into our relationship with God. See, when we, when we put up barriers, instead of sticking it through, through the pain, we just kind of stop anything that God's trying to do in us. And um, disappointment, hurt, <laughs> feel like we have no direction or purpose. I know a lot of us feel like that. And um, so that's why I called this, this message, Wrong Way, God. Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. If you want to turn there, you can. I'll give you a second in case you do want to. Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. And we're going to hop around a lot, so don't feel like you have to keep turning to every single one of the references. Now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So here we have, you know, God's promised that he's going to make this small nothing tribe into a people. And, you know, he has. But now we still have a problem because this small nothing tribe that God has made is their slaves in Egypt, which they're not Egyptians, so you already see the problem. And... Uh, no, well, there, there they are. Well, we got this problem here, God. And so Exodus starts out with the well, just a short summary of their situation. And it says, and God heard what was going on. And then it says this, and God knew. A little foreboding for the Egyptians, right? A little ominous. <laughs> what did God know? <laughs> uh, and anyways, so then uh, we go through here. And now we have God calling this unlikely person from the desert. You know, just living out there by himself in the desert. Him alone with his principles and his sheep. And, uh, well, there he is. <laughs> yeah, a murderer. And just out there shepherding sheep. Okay. So God's like, yep, that's my choice. Yeah. Good call there, God, right? <laughs> you ever feel like that sometimes happens to us? Like, God, what were you thinking here? This is, you, you, you clearly don't know what this is all about. 
this is going to blow up in your face, God. You should listen to me. Right? And then, well, I'll add some other story. So, and hop down to Exodus chapter 4, verses uh, 29 through 31. And it says this. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel, just like God had told uh, Moses to do. Okay? And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses, because Moses was too nervous to talk in front of people. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their afflictions, they bowed low and worshipped. Man, they're all excited. Here we are in slavery. We've cried out to God. God has heard us. He's called this person out of the desert, and he's given us a promise of what's to come. Man, oh man, God, we're really rolling on here now. You know, after all these years of senseless slavery to people that we don't even like, finally, things are going to work out. Okay, now we're, 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 we're moving ahead. Uh... God here is acting on his promises and renewing them. He promised something to Abraham a long time ago, but now he is not only acting on his promises, he's giving the people of Israel new promises. Man, the, the, God just on the move. You, you know, God's saying all these things. Have you ever been in that place in your life? God's, all, God's giving you all these promises, all these, you know, telling you all these things that he's going to do. And man, it's, that sounds great, God. Let, when do we start? You know, let, let's, let's do that. Uh, I've known many a pastor who takes over a, a new church and thinking, you know, okay, God, I, I, I see the vision you've given me. I see what you're, what you're saying you're going to do, so let's do it. When do we start? And they get to the new church all full of hopes and dreams, and within the first two or three years, those, those dreams are gone. So let's look at that, okay? Uh, the, the people are excited, um, but here's the thing. Uh, okay, so it's going to get worse in Egypt. They don't know this now because they're all excited about what God's saying. But actually, it's going to get worse before it actually gets better and they're free from Egypt. So, a minor detail, right? I forgot it was a minor detail. Oh, you know, I guess I missed that one. But uh, Moses actually did know that this was going to happen. He, he did warn them, hey, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And uh, I guess they, they, they missed that part. They were too excited about the end goal that they missed what God was saying in the meantime was going to happen in that valley. Uh, so then you hop on down to Exodus chapter 13, verse uh, 17. And it says, in verse 17, Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds, and when they see war, return to Egypt. Well, okay, now we have God isn't just doing this. He's also making sure that, you know, things are as easy as possible for them. Okay, all right. But here we have a little bit of a problem. Go to the third point there, Ben. That's the wrong way, God. You promised us the land flowing with milk and honey. You're leading us out into the desert. They should have seen that there was a problem when they first started to leave Egypt. And God told them to walk into a, into a large lake. That should have been their first indicator that things might not be as rosy as they originally imagined. You know, actually, back up. They might have probably figured out that things weren't going to be that great when the plagues first started happening. In Egypt. Like, hey, Pharaoh's obviously not real keen on this whole idea of letting olives go. Maybe things aren't going to be rosy. So, okay, they missed it there, I guess. You know, for whatever reason. They, so here we are. They're walking out of, out of Egypt, and God's telling them to walk into a lake. Okay, God, you understand I'm not a fish, right? That's a lake. I can't just swim through it. You know that, right? You, you had us get all this stuff from Egypt. Remember, you said, don't leave anything. Borrow all this stuff from our neighbors. Well, now we got carts full of gold. How are we going to get them through the water, God? You, you're, you're crazy. And then to add insult to injury here, we have the Egyptian armies coming up behind them, trying to take them back. When he just let them go. Man, oh, man. I tell you what, see, Pharaoh read the fine print. Okay, so I have to let you go, but that doesn't mean I can't go out and capture you again, right? Aha! Uh -huh. I have figured the loop, the loophole here. Well, I guess, I guess Pharaoh wasn't paying attention either to the, to the stuff there. So we're going the wrong way, God. I don't know if you know about geography that much, but okay. Egypt is on the northeast part of Africa. And uh, it's really like the Sinai Peninsula, or Saudi Arabia and all that stuff over there. It's a little, it's like a land bridge that, that, that ties Africa into the Middle East. All right. 
Now, Israel isn't technically in the, in, in, in the Middle East. It's, it's, in the, it's in the Near East. <laughs> it's right along the water there. So it's like on the outskirts of all that. It's a little, little bitty plot of land. And uh, it's not that far. I mean, the directions are really simple. There's one road. You don't take, there's no turnoffs. It's a straight highway from Egypt to Canaan. I mean, it's really easy to not get lost. I, 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 even Gracie, you know, wouldn't have to borrow a map. If you've ever traveled with her, you know it's disastrous, disastrous. She's like, how do I get to Alamo again? The road, Gracie, the road! Anyways, anyways. Uh, you know, a really easy road here. But God, for whatever reason, I don't think you know where our highway is here, God. He has them go south of the highway, which should have been an indicator that something was wrong. And then, rather than going north to Canaan, where he promised he was going to take them, he leads them out into the dunes of south. Do you know what's down there? Rocky. Nothing. <laughs> there's sand and there's rock. There's nothing there. So God has them go the exact opposite way where he promised he was going to take them. God, you liar. Why are you bringing me out here to this desert? Now, we would never in our pious self admit that, oh, you know, I never had my doubts. But honestly, let's be honest, you know. God takes us somewhere and it's like, God, this is exactly the opposite of what you said you were going to do. This is, this is the wrong way. So, this isn't how we get to your promises. You know, I already know how to get to the thing that you promised me. And this isn't it. Don't look at me like that. I know you've done that. God gives you a promise. You're all excited. And then time just kind of wears you down. And then God starts doing you something, doing something which is fine. But he's doing the opposite of what he said he was going to do. God, that's not how this works. This is what you said you were going to do. This is the most expedient trip to get there. And I know, God. I mean, I figured this out in my head. I've stayed up many a nights figuring out how to perfectly resolve the situation. And this was not on the list of pre-approved methods. Okay, we're going the wrong way, God. But still, they seem, you know, mostly unshaken. They're like, well, we don't know what the heck's going on, so we're just going to follow you, Moses, down south, I guess. Um, which just takes us to, to the next point there. Uh, ben, if you want to hit it on the slide. With God, the journey is just as important as the destination. We get so wrapped up in where God's taking us, we forget, what about the trip there? When you go on a road trip, do you get in the car and then you get right back out and you're at your location? No, there's a lot of stuff that happens in between. You yell at your kids because they still haven't gotten their shoes on, and then you load up the car and you come back and they still haven't gotten their shoes on, so you yell at them some more. And then, you know, you go sit in a timeout for a little bit, calming down and rubbing your forehead so ah, they're not listening to me. And then you come out and they still don't have their shoes on, so finally you get tired and you put their shoes on for them. And so you turn around to grab your, you know, your stuff, your purse or whatever you have got going on. You turn around and they took the shoes off. Dang it. So you got to put it back on again. And then you're okay. Then, then you get into the car. And then right as you buckle everybody up, you start the car. Mommy, I need to go pee. Great. Fantastic. So then you kick them out of the car. I love my kids. I'm so happy I had kids. Getting them. Mm, already locked up the house and everything. That's, that's just kind of how it goes there, huh? And then... Then you get in the car and you leave and you, you do this whole road trip before you actually reach the destination. There's a lot more going into it than just getting to the destination. But for whatever reason, we think when it comes to God's promises that somehow he's going to circumnavigate the natural order of how he does things. And he's going to make an exception and get you immediately from point A to point B. Now, my college math wasn't great. So let me kind of, I might be wrong on this. But when they had you do the line segments... The A and the B were never immediately on top of each other. They were always separated. And you had to figure out the distance and all kinds of stuff and figure out when the trains are going to pass each other and all that nonsense. You remember those problems in high school? Yeah, that's kind of how God works too. Um, so the, the, the journey is just as important as the destination to God. We learn growth, we learn obedience, we learn love, and we learn, learn wisdom. You know, every story that we like reading has a build, doesn't it? Think of your favorite stories, your favorite movies, your favorite TV shows. There's drama, there, there, there's a build, there's a climax, and then there's resolution, right? That's what gives the story its power, right? Take the Bible, for instance. It starts out with 
God made this beautiful thing going on, and then people wreck it. And then the story ends, right? No, I mean, you've got 66 books through this long, drawn-out process of God making something beautiful again, right? Uh, what about Lord of the Rings? Well, you could say, well, you start up in, in, in first in chapter 1, there's a hobbit, he destroys a ring. Well, okay, well, that kind of takes away all of it. Star Trek, the TV show, or, or movies, I mean, there's so many spin-offs, the books, etc., etc. They found some aliens. It just takes out the whole story, doesn't it? I mean, what, what about uh, Star Wars? Where all some rebels killed an oppressive government. Well, okay, but there's a lot of other things that happened. So, I mean, there were lessons that were learned. Important lessons that were learned. But if you skip all that stuff and you just end the story, you missed all that stuff in the middle. And like Pastor said this morning, God's not just concerned about saving people. He takes great joy in building and creating and recreating. And then he really likes taking something that is completely gone and destroyed past any recognizable features and taking that big, big pile of nothingness and making it into something great. That's just what he does. He takes great joy in it. So saving you, he, obviously he wants to save you, but he wants to do more than that. He wants to build you into something new. He wants to take you from point A to point B. But in the meantime, there's, com there's, there's conflict, right? You guys remember your literature classes in high school? There's conflict, climax, and then resolution, right? That's how God works too. He takes us through all these different things. Sometimes it seems like he causes the conflict just so he can resolve it. Obviously, you know, that's not what he does, but I'm saying sometimes it feels like that. Um, so anyways, and then we go down to Exodus chapter 19. So, we, you know, we, if 13 had us going the wrong way, all right, I, I'm, 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 I guess this isn't great, God, but I, I guess we'll just go along with you. Exodus chapter 19. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt... On that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so they go into the middle of the desert. So surely there's a good plan for this, right? When they set out for Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Oh, great. So we went all this way through the desert. It's very hot. There's nothing to eat or drink. And here we are camped in front of this large rock, which is definitely not the land flowing with milk and honey. Let me double check. No, it's not the land flowing with milk and honey. This is not what you promised God. And I want to go back to Egypt. In fact, they say this multiple times. Even though they had next to no fighting, they still say, I want to go back to Egypt. In fact, this is a common thing. They say it multiple times. It's not like they say it once or twice. They say it repeatedly throughout the whole book of Exodus. I want to go back to Egypt, God. This is not what I signed up for. You said I was going to be freed from slavery. That I was going to get to this great place. And that was going to be that. You took us in the wrong direction, and this is not what you promised. So, I'm going home. It's exactly what we have here. And you have God consistently, consistently trying to tell them, but wait, there's more. But they just won't listen. So that brings us to a, a next point. God, this isn't the promise you gave. <laughs> boy, oh boy, please tell me I'm not the only person who's ever said that to God. <laughs> God, this isn't the promise you gave. You, you said that this was going to happen, but all that's happened is you've taught me to be content with that not happening. But it still hasn't happened. I mean, come on, guys. Don't look at me like with those pious eyes. Like, I don't struggle with these things. Everything's fine. It's fine. Come on. Which takes us to the next point. Now, they were promised a good land, traveled through a lot of desert. Pausing or being stuck is sometimes an important part of growth. If Israel had never gone south and camped in the desert, they never would have received the law. If they never would have received the law, the prophets would have had nothing to point them back to. If the prophets had nothing to point them back to, the meaning of Christ coming would have been more or less nothing to them. The whole point 
was that he gave them a law that was in itself insufficient. It was obsolete even almost as soon as it was given. It was something that was impossible to be achieved. It didn't fix the problem. It showed that there was a problem. Well, that's great and all, God. I like being told that I'm wrong, but that's not, that doesn't help me. Hold on, I'm doing something here. So then after he sends the law, he sends the prophets. And then after he sends the prophets, he sends the Christ. And now we have the full picture. We're looking back and we're saying, ah, ah, uh, okay. But you see, I bet if we were the ones out in the desert, our tune would be a little bit different, huh? Luckily, we all go through our own desert sign. I, and I do mean luckily, because what God did here was fantastic for the people of Israel. While Israel was in Egypt, they worshipped other gods. It's debatable if they even knew who God was. It's debatable. Some people say yes, some people say no. It could technically go either way doesn't really specify. All that we do know is that they were worshiping other gods. And Yahweh was no more than a, what was it called, a household name? But God pointed them back to, okay, now, now we're doing something else here. So we see that them being stuck out in the desert was actually a part of their growth. And I, I want to kind of get that get that, that's I guess the main point I want you to walk away from all this sometimes it feels like you're stuck, you're not going anywhere you're not growing, whatever but the truth is that even in those moments Lord I just feel like nothing's happening Lord when are you going to use me God why won't you make this stuff work out, God when will I see your promises fulfilled, God this that and the other thing, whatever it is that's bothering you those moments of nothingness are amazing opportunities for God to grow you. So what do you do in those times where you seek God? But I did that. That's what got me here in the first place. Got all excited. Went out to the desert thinking that something was going to change, but it didn't change. Well, just hold on. Hold on. The next point there, uh, Benny. Every season is an opportunity. Sometimes in your life, you're going to be plowing ahead and Winning victory after victory, Satan himself will have nothing on you. You're going to be just mowing down the enemy. You're, you're just a great warrior. Yeah, God knows my name because I have proved myself to him. And then there's going to be other times when you feel like you've messed up for the billionth time and there's nothing that anyone can ever do to change you. Then there's other times when you don't feel much of anything. But I want to encourage you that every single one of these seasons in our lives that we go through is an opportunity to learn more about God in a new and different way that you never thought was possible. Because for whatever reason, we are so stubborn that every time that everything's going good, every time that something's going good, we just kind of start tuning out God. Because we don't, we don't need God. I mean, we're self-sufficient, right? But every season is an opportunity. And then that, the next point there, buddy, don't complain for what you want. Live in the now. Use what you have and do what you can. I'll say that again, that was kind of like, don't complain for what you want, where you want to be in life, what you want to achieve in life, the promises that have never been fulfilled. Don't sit around complaining about those kind of stuff. Live in the now. Yeah, that would be great if those things happened like that and if everything worked out how you wanted to, but it didn't. This is where you are now. Stop wasting your time worrying about what you want to be and realize what is. Live in the now. Live in the now. God, if... If you would give me more finances, I would be able to get out of my debt and I'd be able to pay towards missionaries. Live in the now. How can you start spending your money wiser? Live in the now. Well, if I if this if this works out, if don't live in, in the in the tomorrow of, of fantasy, live in the now of reality. You know what the, one of the greatest things I had to learn in with my struggle with panic attacks is that fear doesn't actually exist. Fear is something that we train ourselves to believe based on what we think might happen in the future. But if it's already happened, then we're not afraid of it because we've already gone through it. Death, for instance. Everybody's afraid of death because we're afraid of what that will be like. But when we actually die, it will be over 
very quickly, and we won't be afraid of it anymore because we'll be dead. We'll be in heaven. Unless you're not saved, then, you know, all you own. But, you know, as Christians, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Fear is something that doesn't actually exist in and of itself. It's something that we think exists because we've made it up. I think this is going to happen in the future, so I'm going to be afraid of that thing happening. Then when it actually happens, you're not afraid. For instance, Will Smith said it like this. I'm actually, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember exactly how I said it. He said that when you go skydiving, you're, you're afraid the whole time, but as soon as you jump out of that plane, you're not afraid anymore. You're living in a, you're living in a state of just pure, your senses can't even explain what's happening to you. It's everything leading up to jumping out of the plane. In other words, you're afraid of something that hasn't actually happened yet. That's fear. Being afraid of something that isn't actually now. And that's why, why I say this. Live in the now. Use what you have, not what you want to have, and do what you can. And the next point there, what does God want for you? His main plan for your life? Grow and serve. So in closing, God's promises are costly, but with great costs and through great struggles, there are great victories and great rewards. Do you remember that one battle in World War II where the general sat on his butt and he was able to win past all of his enemies? No, he doesn't remember that battle either. Because World War II wasn't an easy war. World War II was one of the most deadly conflicts in human history. Not including the facts of the Holocaust. But with that great struggle, with that great cost, there was a great victory. See, don't get upset because God's expecting a lot of you or because you're in the middle of a battle. Be happy that the more of a battle there is and the more of a struggle that there is, the greater victory you'll have at the end. You know what's so great about the story of the 300 Spartans who held off the forces of Persia? Because they were so small. But they sacrificed. And their sacrifice was a victory for all of Greece. Because it wasn't about the numbers. It was about the victory. And what God promises to us is that the victory and the reward will be so great that the cost will be next to nothing. That's hard for us to grasp because we live in the now and we want God to work on our terms. You're going the wrong way, God. And God's thinking, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie or not, how does he know where I'm going? Have you ever seen that? On plane, I think it's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is what I think it is. He's driving on the wrong side of the highway in the middle of the night or something. I forget what the situation, but they're driving on the wrong side of the highway, and the people are on the right side of the highway. You're going the wrong way. How do they know where we're going? You know, and that's kind of <laughs> what's happening with God. God's doing this whole thing. And we're, God, you're going the wrong way because we know where we're supposed to be at. And God's saying, you don't know what I'm doing here, man. Just chill out. Chill down, home slice. So Psalm 37, uh, 7, 30, 37 verse 34 says, Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land, or the promises in this context. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. Never forget that verse. If you believe in writing in your Bible, I would highly encourage you to go and highlight that. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the promises. You, the Bible actually says the land, but we're talking about how it applies to us now. So, uh, You will look on when the wicked are cut off. That's something you have to believe in faith, because here's the thing. Did you know that there's never going to be a, life, be a moment in your human life where everything is okay? 
you're going to have struggle after struggle until the day of your death. And then when you die, the people who are left are going to have to struggle with your death. They're going to have to grieve in their own way, and then they're going to have to learn to move on until they die. And then the ones who come after them are going to have to learn the same thing. Because life isn't perfect. But we're looking forward to a time when it will be. Right? So the, the two questions I want to close with, how can I grow and how can I serve? And all these things, in whatever season you're in, wherever God is taking you to, ask yourself those two questions. How can I grow and how can I serve? How can I grow and how can I serve? God, I just feel like I'm stuck. How can I grow in this time? Lord, I feel like you've abandoned me. You've forgotten all of your promises. How can I grow? The pro one of the prophets said it like this. He, he, he gives this long cry out to God, and he says, God, I know that I'm wrong. I'm just going to kind of wait here until you answer me, because what have I got going on? I mean, this just this doesn't seem fair to me, God. So if you will, uh, well, actually, uh, Chef, would you mind closing us in prayer? And then when...